We're quite literally diving into the heart of our new wildlife homestead, our one-acre pond. We'll be exploring and sampling the pond, getting hands-on with nature, uncovering this hidden underwater world, and the creatures that call it home. We've got some pretty exciting methods lined up too. Snorkeling, setting up minnow traps, fishing from shore and our kayak, and even using trail cameras to see what's happening when we're not around. So let's jump right in. This pond was the thing that drew me most to the property. As a fisheries biologist, how could I not be excited about having a pond so close? When we first visited the property, I thought the pond might be fishless. I didn't observe any fish from the shore, and even went as far as bringing all my fishing gear to a showing to see if I could catch anything while my wife and realtor talked about the details of the house. To me, this pond held the most ecological value of anything on the property. And after trying my luck fishing for 30 minutes or so, I came up empty-handed. And while I was disappointed that I didn't catch anything, we were still sold on the house and property and the potential of the pond for future stocking of native freshwater fish. Little did I know, the pond was hiding its own secrets below the surface. The pond is fed by a natural spring and is over 20 feet deep in the center, which is pretty impressive for its size. The surrounding property is a mix of oak pine forest. And at 3,000 feet of elevation, we're right at the transition of the foothill oak savanna and montane forest. We're also lucky enough to have a diverse range of wildlife. They call this place home. Everything from frogs and birds to bats, deers, coyote, foxes, and even the occasional bear and mountain lion. We're using minnow traps to get a good sense of the fish and amphibian population here. A little spoonful, want some? Yeah. Hey. Can I put some in too? I'll, I wanna put some in the corner. My hands smell cat food. Okay. <gasps> Bobby. What go? After my first failed fishing attempt, I thought the pond was fishless and thus potentially supported a healthy and diverse population of amphibian species. But after setting these traps, we discovered it's teeming with fish life. Over the next several days, we're gonna leave these minnow traps out in the pond for 12 hour sets and then come back and see what we've caught. And while we're waiting for the traps to do their thing, we'll also be snorkeling to survey the pond. This is a great way to see what's really happening below the surface especially around all the aquatic vegetation, where fish, frogs, and insects like to hang out. It has the added bonus of being a throwing adventure too for the boys. Hunter wouldn't be surprised at all if he sees an alligator out there. What a world of adventure for them. As a father, I absolutely love this. But the only reptile I've seen on the pond was a garter snake. I've also seen a lot of native frogs here too. But we'll want to keep an eye out for the bullfrogs, as they're a non-native invasive, and they thrive in these types of farm pond environments. Snorkeling in a pond, well, snorkeling in any water for the matter, gives you a whole new perspective you can really get a feel for the habitat with your head in the water. Right now, we're seeing a lot of young of the year bluegill in the macrophyte beds. And what's even more interesting, young of the year largemouth bass. Put them in the box. In 
the basket. Okay, so what do we got here? We got six of these. So you hold it right here by its side. Like this. And then you see how the spines go up? And you I see the feel. blue here on the back? And on its gill. So that's blue gill. You can see the vertical bars? Yeah. So we and have it's one, two, it's three, four, five, six of those. Down, 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 down. We have our bass friend. So we got that marked down. And all these down. There. Is that right. how you hold it? Yeah. So besides the big dot, another thing you could do is look at the pectoral fin. Mm -hmm. The pectoral fin could, they're pretty long. This is a pectoral fin, right here. Yeah, bend. That'll bend up towards the eye. All right, we got a bass, right? Large yep. mouth, we think. Large mouth bass here. Yeah, a ton of wing, Dad. Uh -huh. See, it's got the, that all the tadpoles vertical have line. Eyes. All the bullfrog tadpoles have yellow See the coloration eyes. on it, too? Yeah. And then we got... All the tadpoles, right? Mm -hmm. Kiss them. Oh. Why did you want to be? And what do we have here? Bluegill and largemouth bass, just like I suspected after our snorkeling survey. These are year zero fish, meaning they were born this year. What's interesting is that I haven't caught any sizable adult bass. But PJ did catch an adult bluegill off the small swim dock I've just built, the dock being the only non-natural item I plan to use in the pond. Because after all, who can resist a good swim on a hot summer's day? Or a snork session? We're sampling this one acre pond to see what fish species and other critters are in it on our wildlife homestead. Not catching anything fishing, I think the abundance of catchable sized bass in the pond is still pretty small, especially after a neighbor informed us that the pond mostly dried up in 2022. But given our minnow trap yield, it looks like both adult bass and bluegill survived and spawned successfully this past spring. So that's good news. Over time, we should see the size of these fish grow, and that might mean a lot better fishing next year. Although I hope this is not to the detriment of the native chorus frog boom we experienced in the first part of summer. I guess time will tell, and there's no removing the fish now. At least not until we succumb to another drought year. Now, if we're gonna manage this pond for both wildlife and maybe some trout fishing in the future, we'll need to know what we're working with. So we're also checking the water temperature and dissolved oxygen levels at different depths to see if we can possibly sustain a modest trout fishery in the future which has been a lifelong dream of mine since getting my first fly rod at age eight. Catching trout from my own property. What could be better? As big Dad, as my hand. Dad, what's that's up? a big bluegill. Good news. The water temperature is within a sublethal range of trout and the dissolved oxygen is solid too. That means the pond could potentially support a few trout species like rainbows or brook trout. Of course, if they don't survive over summer, they could still provide forage for the bass in the meantime. And I need to decide if I wanted to maintain the effort and investment necessary for a put and take fishery. Which, after further thought, I don't think I'd want to pursue. This wouldn't be very natural or sustainable, and I'd be totally content with having only a warm water fishery on the property. But I guess time will tell for that as well. Wait and observe. Before seeing what other crazy creatures call this pond their home, if you've enjoyed this episode so far, please give it a like and let me know if that thumbs up explodes for you with color. It's not just about fish in the pond. There's a whole ecosystem at work here. Early in the summer, the air was filled with the sound of chorus frogs, and we've since trapped a few bullfrog tadpoles in the minnow traps. What fun. The boys absolutely love this. My wife, not so much. Especially to her surprise when they brought some into the kitchen one afternoon to show her. The native frogs are doing well but we'll keep an eye on the bullfrog populations to make sure they don't take over. I've since seen a few sizable adults, and the boys have also discovered that American bullfrogs have a hard time passing up a size 16 dry fly. Who would have thought fishing for bullfrogs would be so easy? And if they do get out of hand, maybe we'll have to entertain the possibility of a bullfrog leg and fish fry dinner from the pond. Let me know your thoughts on that one. I'm also curious, if any other amphibians are using the pond. Likely not with all the fish. However, California newts are common in the area, and we also have a seasonal creek on the property 
that might provide better habitat for the newts and salamanders during the spring. So I want to survey that as well once it's activated. Besides an abundance of frogs, we've also got an abundance of insects to support the pond. Dragonflies, damselflies, mayflies, and yes, mosquitoes, providing a good source of protein to fish, ducks, and frogs alike. The dragonflies aren't only food, they're a legitimate hunter as well, known to be a great mosquito control mechanism, so I'm counting on them to keep our mosquito population in check. The mosquitoes are pretty bad at the start of the season, but thanks to these guys, and some help from the bats at night, they're getting them under control. The bird life around the pond is just as impressive as in the forest. We've got mallards, Canada geese, belted kingfisher, great blue heron, great egret, and a whole range of songbirds, like red-winged blackbirds and black phoebe. PJ even spotted a wood duck once, which got me thinking about building some wood duck nest box. I'm also trying to figure out if it's possible to implement some moist soil management practices to support more waterfowl during the nesting and wintering season. But since I don't have much control of the water level on the pond, besides potentially pumping off some, I'm not so sure how manageable this idea might be. If you have any experience with this sort of practice, let me know. For now, I'll just continue to observe the water level drop over summer and see what I can potentially do this fall to benefit waterfowl. But I definitely think building a nest box on the pond is a doable start. One of the coolest things about living on a wildlife homestead so far is seeing how the larger wildlife use the pond. We've caught deer and raccoons on our trail camera, and even found some very large bear tracks in the mud one morning. Though we haven't caught the bear on camera yet, I'm hopeful we'll get that footage soon. And in the heat of summer, I wouldn't be half surprised to see a black bear taking a dip out there. But let's rewind to the deer, a doe and her fawn, which frequent the property, so much so that I'm considering featuring them on a future episode. So let me know if that's something you'd like to see. They're super cute, and it's been interesting observing their personalities and behaviors this summer. And let's not forget about the plants. The pond has a healthy diversity of emergent and submergent macrophyte species, including American pondweed, coontail, and cattails, which provide great habitat for the fish and insects. Continuing around and near the pond, we've got a healthy amount of riparian habitat that includes willows, sedges, and some other cool plants such as self heal, a settler's favorite, all framed by a beautiful oak pine forest. It's a perfect balance of aquatic and terrestrial plant life, and I know the waterfowl and other wildlife will benefit from it greatly. As we look ahead, we've got some big plans for this pond. We'll start by building some nest boxes for the ducks, and then likely work on enhancing the fish habitat. Stocking trout is definitely on the table, not just for my selfish fishing ambitions, but also to support the true fishermen of the pond, the egrets, herons, and kingfisher. Who knows, maybe we'll even attract an osprey or bald eagle to the area one day. For the time being, I'm very pleased with the diversity of wildlife calling this pond their home. I would like to continue observing and recording what I see, and plan out how we can gradually improve the area to better support them. This pond has been an incredible addition to our lives. It's not just a place to explore and fish. It's where my boys are learning about nature firsthand. They're wild, free, and most importantly, connected to the natural world in a way that I hope stays with them for a lifetime. We've only just begun to uncover the wonders of this pond, and there's so much more to explore as we continue building and managing our wildlife homestead. If you're enjoying the journey with us so far, be sure to subscribe. You won't miss future episodes, and it'll help us reach our goal of 1,000 subscribers. So please continue to spread the word, and thanks for all the great support so far. It's been a lot of fun getting to know some of you better through the comments. And don't miss our next episode, where we'll dive into the backstory and take you on a full tour of our wildlife homestead. Until next time, get outside and explore your own natural spaces.